Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Carlo Ratti. I'm a professor at MIT. We will run the, the Sensible City Lab. Uh, and so, uh, welcome everybody to Davos Agenda 2021 into this session on building net, net zero cities. Uh, today is going to be a very exciting discussion with, uh, with all of our panelists. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping first. You know, this session is going to be half an hour. It's going to be open broadcast to everybody around the world. And then we'll be, this will be followed by another half an hour session later that's open to all the top link uh, participants. Um, also, I wanted to mention that this is part of our uh, initiative at, uh, at the World Economy Forum. Uh, on next, next zero carbon cities, an integrated approach. And so the session is part of this. And for those of you who are interested, there's a very, very exciting report that just came out uh, uh, on the topic on how we can build more sustainable cities. Um, so cities, if you need to remember four numbers about cities, remember the following four numbers, 250, 75, and 80. Cities are only 2% of the surface of the planet, but they're 50% actually today a little bit over 50% of the population, and there are 75% of uh, energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions. So if we can do something to make our cities a little bit more sustainable, that could be a great deal uh, globally. So having said that, I really wanted to start with our uh, exciting panelists. I want to start with uh, Anna Koenig, who's the mayor of Stockholm. Um, and Anna, first of all, I want to ask you about, you know, your role on the board, uh, if you could comment a little bit on this initiative and, uh, you know, on how you see it and how it actually has helped shape some of the initiatives you have been implementing in Stockholm. Thank you so much, Carlo. It's, it's really a privilege to be on the board to work with this holistic perspective on our mutual challenges. And that is why this is so important, because it helps cities on the path toward a climate positive for, for a city of Stockholm, but also climate neutral uh, cities around the world to help them um, to fulfill our goals. Because while other initiative emphasizes on different solutions for different sectors, this approach is to take... Um, to find a model uh, to a more integrated system where we can look at different sectors and how they interact. For example, uh, ultra-efficient buildings, smart uh, energy uh, infrastructure, but of course also clean electrification. Um, and we hope to, to succeed um, in our goals uh, to, towards uh, you know, job creation, well-being for our citizens, it's about health, and of course, improve resiliency, uh, and to our goal to get, um, towards uh, climate neutrality. Uh, so this really helped us find the measures, how to integrate, I mean, everything from energy efficiency in building and retrofittings to new mobility solutions and, and also to integrate solution at scale. Often we focus on one building at a time, but it's about how buildings also interact with each other uh, at scale. So it's, it's really interesting when we build new districts in our cities around the world, but also when we retrofit uh, existing areas. Yeah, and your point about scale is very, you know, is key, and actually we'll talk about this later, is about, you know, a city is really a system of systems, and so how do we scale up from the individual building to the neighborhood, to the whole city? But I want to ask you as well something about, you know, what we've been living uh, over the past few months, and actually this has been part of the, some of the discussions we, we had at the board, and is about the pandemic, and how do you see that that could change, for instance, our cities and making them more sustainable? I know one of the points you've been advocating is also how we can reschedule our lives in our cities in order again to make better use of the existing infrastructure. Thank you, Carla. That's really a good point because I think many policymakers today um, really just talk about new infrastructure and they want new measures from the national level. But, but I think we can really learn about how we can use our existing infrastructure in a better way so if you look at the pandemic, we, many countries have had a strategy of bending the curve so that demand don't exceed and um, supply at peak hours or at peak time. You can have that strategy when it comes to healthcare or energy, but also how you plan the city. 
So we have all this infrastructure at place, but what if more people are working from home uh, before lunch and then coming to the office after lunch, or then you don't have so much pressure on the public transport, or, or if you reschedule the gymnasiums, because many students, researchers show, uh, learn better later on the day. So if they start school a little bit later, then you don't have so much pressure on traffic, on public infrastructures, and so on. So we can really use what we have uh, in a more sustainable way. And that's also, of course, when it comes to energy. So I think we should reschedule our cities to use what we have in a more efficient way. Thank you, Anna. And, uh, yes, you know, certainly one of the tragedies of the city in the, in, or cities in the 20th century was really having everything synchronized. And so you had peak hour, rush hour, you know, and then there was a lot of congestion. So if you can actually reschedule cities, thanks to the newfound flexibility following the pandemic, that could be a, a big deal, have a big impact and make them more sustainable. Incidentally, it's exactly what happens with energy markets and we'll hear about that in a moment, uh, about how IT can help us in, in that direction. But before that, um, let me uh, move to Mamounia Sharif, who is, uh, as you all know, Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Habitat. Mamounia, it's great to have you here on the panel. And I wonder you to, you know, we heard the lesson from Stockholm. And, uh, you know, how would you bring it to, to emerging countries? You know, I believe today you are in Nairobi, where UN Habitat is based, but you've been working a lot with uh, cities in emerging countries. Uh, what do you think? How could they achieve the same goals? Thank you very much, uh, Carlo. Thank you very much. I would like to congratulate World Economic Forum for the net, for the net zero uh, carbon uh, cities report, and I'm very, very happy the inclusion of the compact cities uh, section. So your questions about the about how uh, cities uh, reflect and 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 uh, react to to the uh, new phenomena. I think we should look into the to analyze the uh, the urbanizing trend at the moment. I think we we should recognize that over the last twenty years, the city grew three times more than the population. So this is a um, uh, very excessive and unnecessary footprint. Then I want to like to link it into the energy. And at average, we are also looking into the different geographies and the cities expanded in their territories more than 10 to 20 kilometers of uh, their former limit. And the densities now is reduced on average of 20%. So how the cities in the de developing world, and I think this is very important for us to look into the integrated energy approach that mentioned in the net zero cities report that inquire or requires to include the space the space in the cities as essential variable because systematic uh, efficiency cannot be uh, be a smart solution alone on sectoral so when we look into the cities i think we would like to like to like to bring to you the uh, the, the, the the to rethink the notion of proximity over accessibility, connectivity, the location and the function of the cities, the the the, the cities in terms of the regular, the, the the solution, regulatory solution, the governance and the multiple use of function. And I would like also to bring to you that with the, the need of this uh, 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 integrated response, not only related to energy sectors, we need to think in terms of new economic geography and redefine the role and the function of cities and region. And especially in the developing uh, countries, as you know that low and middle income uh, uh, countries accounted only for 14.5% of global emission, but account for 90% of the future urban growth. So I think that we need to focus on the developing world by putting in place low carbon development trajectory and to meet the human development needs not only the energy, but also the human, and also pursuing the decarbonation uh, uh, of the uh, developed world cannot be at the expense of the people and dignity, the access to clean energy in the developing world. I think this is very important for us to look into the proper financing and regulatory reform. In the, in the developing world, this is a very, very less. And also to look into the capacity for the integrated planning, not only energy planning, but urban design, good planning with energy is the component of it. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mamunio. So, uh, so basically, you know, compactness is very, very important. We know that compact cities use, in general, on average, mass less, much less energy. For those of you who are listening, you know, if you look at this very interesting graph, where you see the density of the city and energy consumption per capita. So, uh, in your case, you know, making them more compact, and certainly looking at this, compact means uh, better in terms of energy sustainability, but also in terms of social sustainability, how the community can interact better together. But Mamunia, would you like to uh, expand a little bit on a, on a related point, which is what we are hearing a lot about today. Uh, you know, this has been championed by the mayor of Paris as part of C40, but also many other cities. So when you think about the compact cities, how this city doesn't need to be just, you know, one single area, uh, but actually can be broken down into what some people call the 15-minute city. So in smaller district where you can find most of the things you need. So this has been, uh, you know, a very exciting and ambitious goal. Clearly, you know, a big city is more than a 15-minute city. Uh, you know, we might say that perhaps the opera theater, uh, you know, the market and many other exciting things might be beyond the 15 minutes, but inside the 15 minutes, you can get most of the things you need so that actually the city is more sustainable. So it would be great to hear from you actually how this lesson that actually has been championed in many cities in the, in the north could actually be, be applied to the global south. Yeah, I, I think what, what is, is important here is that is we have to really look at the function of the cities. And we shouldn't forget the intermediary cities around. So we have to look into the corridor. The, the urban corridor. So because we won't be competing among cities. So I think when you look at the function of the cities, then we can uh, allocate, for example, that is uh, uh, the, 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 the concept of the 15 uh, minute cities and where, where we're looking, going back into the uh, neighborhood, sustainable, uh, self-sustained self neighborhood. So I think this is very, very important where you can get the education, the, the, the convenience goods, but of course, beyond the 15 minutes, you get the higher level of the convenience code and also the, the, uh, the, the facilities. So I think what we should understand now is that to understand how the ecosystem of the city, how the city is function, and whether is it 15 minute city or the donut city. But I think that is the most important is to look into the integrated part of the city. We cannot look energy by itself. So we have to be integrated and going back to the planning and urban design of the cities, which I said just now, energy is one of the components of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mamunia. So then I'd like, I like now to, to move to Michael Lama, who's a chairman and chief executive officer of Train Technologies. And, uh, you know, Michael, if we build on what we were just here, you know, you start to see the city as this kind of system of systems. Uh, so what's your perspective on it? Yeah, it's so interrelated, Carlo, and thank you. Uh, and thank you to other panelists as well. Anna's point, I think, was, was right on about the fact that you've got to consider all these things together, the generation and distribution of power, agriculture, mobility, transportation, and, and buildings. Very passionate about buildings in particular because buildings are 40% of the carbon emissions that occur within the world, and particularly in cities. And Specifically, HVAC is the number one contributor of that. Again, it's 40% of that number. So you find that 15% of the world's carbon emissions happen by heating and ventilating air conditioning buildings. It grows to 25% by 2030 with what we know today to be uh, the code standards and practices in the world. So the, the, the ability to take out some of the, the, the chemicals, the chlorine, the fluorine, that power refrigerants for buildings can eliminate 99% of that issue. The technology exists today, and therefore you could actually drop tomorrow that component of greenhouse gas emissions by eliminating chlorine fluorine from refrigerants and buildings. We're seeing trends around this in the world today, but very passionate that this is a technology that can be implemented, and it really is the, the, the trigger in my mind around really resetting uh, the baseline for carbon emissions. When you look at transportation, particularly refrigerated uh, foods and medicines, vaccines as an example, you could also solve the problem there with the same uh, chemical composition of refrigerants, but you can, in addition, electrify. You can electrify buildings, you can electrify transport refrigeration, remove the diesel engines, remove the power sources. 
Uh, when you collect those two components of transportation of food and medicine and buildings together, one third of the world's carbon emissions could be literally brought to zero with technology that exists today. I think there's urgency to do this. The time to act is now. Uh, we don't need incentives to do that because often the total cost of ownership is less than you would find um, with alternative solutions. So um, I'm excited about the future. Also a little bit worried as we get through this pandemic because all of the mitigating things that we do around COVID, around indoor air quality, around food safety, actually increase demand of power generation and therefore carbon emissions. So to neutralize all that, we have to solve that problem in the short term and then get, get really onto the actions uh, that I described earlier with buildings and transport refrigeration in particular. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Michael. So, so basically you're focusing on the hardware, how we can you know, act on the hardware, both in terms of how it is assembled and also in terms of you know, moving to electrification. But what about the software? Now, how can we use intelligence then in order to better synchronize all the different pieces? Yes, that's critical. You can't do this with hardware alone. You, you have to use the information uh, coming from buildings around occupancies, around outdoor temperature and trends to be able to optimize these systems. And so the, the, the one thing you're seeing here, uh, really through the efforts in net zero cities, but also through the pandemic, is the acceleration of digital uh, optimization, digital services coming into buildings to keep buildings operating at their designs and at their models. And so that is a silver lining through this, is the, is the amount of, of information flowing uh, around buildings about how to optimize that whole equation. So again, this is only one of the system of things here, one of the systems, the subsystems. It's important to think about this all collectively together, but there are, there's expertise throughout the world to attack these subsystems in an integrated way. Thank you. Th thank you, Michael. Yes, so basically using sensors, using artificial intelligence, we can start having buildings. So the built environment can start responding to us in a much more dynamic way, almost like a living thing. And as a result, it can help us save, save a lot of energy. But if, you know, if this is happening at the building level, then I'd like to move to, to our uh, four panelists, uh, uh, to Lei Zhang, uh, who's Chief Executive Officer of Envision Group in, uh, in China. Uh, in Chang, so I'd like to, to, to ask you, so we heard this about the building level, but how do we move to the city level? How do we integrate, for instance, mobility and, and address it with the same approach? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think uh, the digital uh, infrastructure probably is going to be the most essential part to support a net zero city because the net zero, net zero city is going to run on the renewables. However, the renewables are intermittent, probably coming from a suburb area or even far away planes through the high voltage network. So you need to create adaptive demand to fit into the intermittent supply. So then the entire system have to be real time organized, orchestrated, synchronized. So that's why digital infrastructure is so important. At the same time, if, if the city to be net zero, you have to electrify your transportation system. So it is going to bring a huge challenge to electrical grid. If the millions car are charging a similar time zone, it's going to make the electrical system collapse. However, through the efficient orchestration by the digital network, so this kind of millions of cars can become the mobile storage because 95% of a passenger vehicle, they are sitting idle most of the time. They can be the effective storage to support your energy network. At the same time, so we see the digital infrastructure is going to bring the huge flexibility to the city. For instance, as Michael said, the 40% uh, carbon emission is from building. What I can have said through our uh, project in Singapore, we found 40% of energy needs in Singapore is coming from HVAC. So if we can harness this HVAC system into the adaptive load, you basically, you can provide almost free storage 
and a free flexibility to the city, which is very meaningful. So to support the intermittent renewable energy. Yeah. So 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 basically, again, you know, software and hardware. So hardware, we need to electrify more. When we can electrify, we can bring intelligence and better match supply and demand. Just as a follow-up thing, you know, as you're taking this broader perspective about the city. Now, when you're looking, you know, ahead and look at say COP26. You know, what do you think could be the incentives or, you know, how can we actually align stakeholders in order to, to reach some of the things you're mentioning about the city? Uh, what I, as I said, the technology for the, the smart digital infrastructure is there. For instance, like Singapore government has been taking the Decada platform to, to be the IoT platform for the city. But... As I said, what's the most important thing is about the policy change. We have to create the effective market mechanism to make the flexibility as the currency. So we should make the flexibility, not only the daily flexibility, but also seasonal flexibility as the trading currency to encourage the long-term or short-term investment on this intelligent infrastructure or other storage technology, then so the city can deal with the intermittent the renew, renewable energy system. Yeah. So, so basically, if you, if you look, thank you, thank you, Jiang. So basically, if you look at this, you know, one key word we heard and from different directions is really flexibility, is how, you know, we can live a more flexible, we can run a more flexible city, live a more flexible life, also, you know, thinking about the post-pandemic life, but probably flexibility is not enough unless we got the hardware and software that are able to respond in a, in a more dynamic way. So I'd like to say, you know, we've got a few more minutes. Any additional comments on, on this, you know, in the discussion? Um, maybe Anna, uh, going, going back to you, you know, how do you see uh, some of what we just heard from Chang as an opportunity for, for Stockholm? Yeah, I think that was great remarks. And actually, we have a test bed now together with grid owners um, that where we col um, connect schools and thousands of households and companies to have a marketplace when it comes to, to flexibility, uh, when it comes to energy capacity. We call it stock on flex. So it's not about to demand and supply and, and buy um, if you have... Um, capacity over it's about actually if, to not use energy during peak where it, it could be seasonal but it also could be on a daily basis so for example if if some ho household doesn't use energy at a certain time there's also they could um, have uh, they get payment for that so it's a new kind of test bed when it comes to market solutions for flexibility just one solution where, where we as a city are very active with our schools and households and, and, and other stakeholders. And that's really great. So basically, we, we got the flexible platform, then you know, we also need to have the proper incentives in place in order to take advantage of that uh, flexibility. And Maimuna, uh, you know, you're, you're in Nairobi, which is uh, kind of, some people call it a bit the Silicon Valley of Africa. There's a lot of experimentation also. There have been a lot of, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, new developments in terms of uh, um, micropayments, mobile payments, and so on. I mean, do you think that such digital platforms could play a role in uh, cities in the global south? Yeah, um, when I would like to start with uh, when to, to continue with the software and the hardware that we are talking about just now and link it to the digitalization. I think it is very, very important for the uh, cities in the global south is also to look into the capacity and also the, 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 uh, the capacity in terms of the hardware and the software. Of course, the hardware in terms of this uh, investment, in terms of the uh, governance, uh, the software, in terms of the leadership, in terms of regulatory, and of course, in terms of the, the, the hardware is the investment. I think this is very important to the, the, to the Global South because if you know that it's the energy consumption at the very city, le the city level is around 70%. And we also consume seventy percent of the energy, and also, and 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 and, and seventy percent of the uh, uh, carbon emission. And yet, and now seventy percent of the infrastructure is still to be built. And what type of 
infrastructure that we want to link into the, the uh, energy saving. I think this is very important because in the global south, there are lack of uh, proper uh, financing and regulatory reform, and we need to de decentralize the power system. We also need to the capacity to, un uh, to undertake integrated evaluation. So uh, I would like to see that that is uh, the difficulties. We are also look into the building codes that is mentioned by, uh, by Lee Zhang just now, where is the, the, the importance of it, and also the, the, the complication in terms of the business model. Uh, at the the, the uh, global south, so we need and the, the resources are very very scarce, and and data is also is very important uh, in this case in order to move forward. So what I would like to 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 conclude is that we have to rethink in terms of the geography, rethink into the better connectivity, different urban and territorial function, and also all function must be included, not only the net zero function, not only the the energy design, but rather integrated and planning and urban design with energy component within the space element. I think that is very, very important, and not only in Global South, I think in, in, in the world. Thank you very much. You know, Over to you. thank you, Maria. Those are very, very interesting points. And Michael, very quickly, as we are running, uh, we're getting close to the end. So, uh, you know, uh, you've seen there seems to be a lot of demand from cities, you know, in, in different countries in the Global South. And, you know, some of the solutions you mentioned are at the building level, so you need to deal with uh, private ownership, might be easier. But when you need to apply to the same thing at the, at the global level, you know, what type of, you know, PPPs or what type of approaches could you think about uh, well, in order to bring your solutions in terms of hardware and software to cities at scale? Yeah. First of all, the economics have to work, and, and maybe just a couple quick points. Uh, in Stockholm, as an example, I don't know that you allow fossil fuel uh, heating anymore, replacing boilers with fossil fuel. And uh, it's 300 to 400% more efficient to not do that and to put new technology in. Uh, or as an example, uh, Li Zhang mentioned using cars as batteries. You can use buildings as batteries, actually storing uh, late heat and cooling in buildings to be used when you need it. The innovation is remarkable. It just needs now to really, the economics are working. And we just have to have policies and standards that allow for that innovation to take place. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So uh, we, we need to wrap up this first uh, uh, half an hour, but it seems to me that the themes and the actions are really, really clear, and there seems to be a lot of demand from cities. It's about the hardware. How can we make a hardware that is more flexible? Also, thanks to some of the new conditions we are living in now following the pandemic, the higher flexibility we have in our lives. And then, you know, thanks to the software, how we can then run the city in a much more efficient way.